as quickly and dramatically as Brexit. It did more to divide these isles than the Roman conquerors. Meghan Markle, even me. For six years, politics in this country was no longer about conservatives or Labour, right or left. It was leave or remain. Friends broke up over it. Families split up over it. But voters are moving on. UKIP was wiped off the political map at last week's local elections. It now has precisely zero elected representatives anywhere in the country. Reform UK, the rebranded Brexit party, averaged just 6% of the vote and won just six councillors nationwide. In short, when it comes to Brexit, it does seem like most of us are just more over it. But as much as voters have moved on, Britain sadly has not. We have the worst performing G7 economy. Even Russia will grow faster this year. Every other major economy faced the same pandemic, the same war in Europe, the same rocketing inflation and cost of living crises. But nobody else had Brexit on top of it. The long-promised tidal wave of Brexit benefits, Pete with blue passports, and now seems to be petering into a putrid puddle. Even the grand master of Brexit himself, Nigel Farage, now says this. We haven't actually benefited from Brexit economically, what we could have done. I mean, what Brexit's proved, I'm afraid, is that our politicians are about as useless as the commissioners in Brussels were. We've mismanaged this totally. And if you look at simple things, Simple things uh, such as takeovers, such as corporation tax. We are driving business away from our country. Arguably, now we're back in control, we're regulating our own businesses even more than they were okay. as EU members. Brexit has failed. Brexit has failed. No benefits to Brexit. This is the guy that sold it to us, Nigel Farage. And it's hard to argue with him. We were promised Brexit would mean control of the borders, but immigration is way up. There's a migrant crisis in the channel. We were promised glorious free trade deals. It would be the easiest deals in human history. Where are they? We were told the 5,000 EU laws would be spectacularly scrubbed from the statute books as we wrestle control back of our sovereign democracy. In fact, it's going to be more like 600. And I haven't had a single person who can explain what difference it'll make. Full disclosure, I didn't think Brexit was a good idea, and I voted against it. But I also respect the democratic will of the people, unlike some of the more ardent Ramonas. And I later voted for Boris Johnson's Conservative government because they were the only people in that 29 election prepared to honour the result of the referendum and therefore to honour democracy. If you don't accept the results of elections or referenda, then you're not a democracy and you can't be a Democrat. Now, more and more people are changing their minds. The evidence that it isn't working is piling up. And it's probably time to have a serious grown-up debate on what we do about this. And a reminder, Nigel Farage, who says Brexit has failed, well, he originally said this. If Brexit is a disaster, I will go and live abroad. I'll go and live somewhere else. Is this invention going to put it else? Well, off you go, then. I'll keep hearing that Rwanda's rather nice at this time of year, Nigel. Well, joining me now is the Reform Party advisor and former Brexit Party MEP, Alex Phillips, by the US editor-at-large, the Financial Times, Gillian Tett, uh, from across the pond. Well, welcome to all of you. Good to see you. All right, Alex. Uh, I watched you the other night on Newsnight uh, getting brutalised by Alistair <laughs> Campbell, which I thought you handled him, you handled him very well. Let's take a little look at some of it. It was pretty painful viewing. When I say you talk nonsense, when I say you talk nonsense, let me finish. All of those laws that you talked about were enacted by elected British governments and elected British parliaments. The fact that you in Europe couldn't do anything about it underlines that the sovereignty lay here. So all your lies about taking back control, any, more money for the NHS, sovereignty, hold on, immigration, hold on, hold the list of it, you uh, have I, knew, I knew you were going to come up with, you know, the, 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 the money for the NHS. Alexander Nothing Phillips. screws me, not my campaign. And it's very rich, a man who essentially was part of telling lies to invade a country, okay, to okay. accuse me of dishonesty. I think you might have lost okay. the argument there, my dear. If I may patronise you even more. Well, good evening, my dear. Uh, <laughs> Hi. Uh, I'm not going to uh, talk to you in that way, because Alistair, Thank as you. always, vents his spleen in a quite intimidating manner, actually. I thought it was mm. uncomfortable viewing. However, on the central argument about Brexit failing, when even Nigel Farage has to admit it's failed and there are no obvious benefits, here we are seven years after that referendum took place. Is it not time just to... Nothing wrong with admitting mistakes. Is it not time we just wait? You know what? It hasn't worked. Let's try something else. Uh, one of the reasons it hasn't worked is because no one's wants to use any of the levers that we now have as a sovereign nation to make it work. Well, why wouldn't they? Well, it's a good question. You need to ask them, not me. I you're mean, saying the Conservative Party that voted for this, 
The Conservative Party mm. that won a huge majority on getting mm -hmm. Brexit done. Which we helped them do by but standing you, down. You really expect people to believe that that same Conservative Party is actively conspiring to, to stop Brexit being whether a benefit to Whether it's us. conspiracy or incompetence, I don't know. But at the end of the day, but the big issue here is actually the TCA, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, a.k.a. the Oven Ready Deal, because that actually binds us to certain elements of staying in step with the EU, which means we're not able to diverge in, in ways in which would be very productive for our economy. So, for example, state subsidies. We're not allowed to give state subsidies to strategic sectors to therefore render ourselves more So it wasn't an Oven Ready Deal at all? No, it's a terrible deal, but, right. but, but, but we knew that. But isn't, the problem, isn't the problem that the idea of Brexit was fine to a lot of people, it was, but it the was actual fine. reality of trying to implement what it stood for proved to be, it, in then, the end, impossible? Well, one of the reasons I think that that was the case is you've got to, you know, turn your memory back to uh, the awful scenes in Parliament when the, uh, let's say, the establishment wanted to overturn the, re the result of the referendum. And all of this shouting and screaming and, uh, you know, proroguing the Parliament and name-calling and people going over to brief Brussels from the other side, it actually made the environment in which to make a constructive deal almost impossible. And at the end of the day, we were on the cusp of essentially losing Brexit altogether around 2019. Boris Johnson inherited the Ollie Robin agreement that Theresa May had drawn up, which is a dreadful deal. It doesn't really diverge from the EU or give us any particular sort of, you know, powerful sovereignty in the way that Brexiteers wished and still wish, actually, we, we had. Um, and this oven-ready deal had a slight change to Northern Ireland protocol. He said it won't put a border down the Irish well, Sea. The oven-ready deal, did. to be honest, was, was a very burnt dish it from, was. from the start. It they, was. they pressed the wrong knobs. Let's bring in Gillian who's been listening to this across the, the, the Atlantic in New York. Well, Gillian, look, you work for the Financial Times, therefore you de facto have an enormous economic brain. Did Brexit ever make sense to you? No. I thought from the moment it was put on the table, it was one of the biggest acts of self-sabotage that we've ever seen in British history. Um, like you, Piers, when the vote went through, um, I was very willing to recognise the result of the referendum, even though I thought it was a deeply flawed referendum, and was very much hoping that um, the idea of Brexit would be translated into a policy for a flexible, nimble, open British economic strategy. Um, in fact, what's happened has been a backward-looking, parochial, um, paternalistic type of policy um, that's been you know, defensive and hesitant. So it's no surprise that Brexit has been nothing short of a disaster for the British economy. Um, it doesn't give me any comfort to say, I told you so. Many people who were involved in international finance and business were saying that you know, right from the start. But I personally think it's time for a pretty serious rethink. Well, you're not the only one. Because... And I think I should say, sitting, sitting on the American side of the Atlantic, mm. um, you know, many people in America are just baffled that Britain would have ever embarked on this act of self-sabotage um, and not realised the damage it was going to cause earlier on. And, well, you know, let's face it, you know, Britain has got the worst performance amongst the G7. Um, it's, you know, got really serious fundamental economic problems now um, and a real lack of competence. And apart from the damage that Brexit has done to the trading links um, and the competitiveness, the fact it's distracted politicians and policymakers and voters from really core issues around where Britain is going in the future with its economic strategy is tragic as well. Yeah, well, you're not the only one who's uh, expressing concern about this. The re most recent uh, YouGov poll says 53% of UK voters now think Brexit was the wrong decision. Nearly a fifth of Leave voters think it was wrong to vote for Brexit. 65% of people think the government's handling the UK's exit from the EU badly. Polling shows that 50% want to rejoin the EU and so on and so on. It's estimated that Brexit is costing the UK £1,000 per household and has cost the UK £29 billion in business investment. That's according to the Bank of England. Um, maybe cost the UK economy £100 billion a year, according to Bloomberg. I mean, you put all this together. I guess the obvious question is, you know, we, we did reverse our decision after 40 years, uh, didn't we? To, you know, the, the Europe decision was only 40 years old. Why can't we reverse it again? It's been seven years since this referendum. Are we not a big enough, a mature enough country to say, actually, this hasn't worked and to perhaps have another referendum? I mean, why not? Well, I personally would argue the answer to that is yes, we should. 
Um, I know it would be destructive and distracting again, but I think that it would certainly get a sense of whether the population, the country, actually wants to stick with this Brexit course or not going forward. Um, but I appreciate that, you know, there are plenty of people who say, don't try and open that can of worms right now. Um, it's going to be too destructive and too distracting. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Alex Phillips, I mean, if you get anything else wrong in life, it, I mean, there comes a point when after seven years of getting something wrong, if a marriage went this badly wrong after seven years, you'd be heading full steam to the divorce courts, wouldn't you? I mean, why are we, why are we lassoed? to this thing of Brexit, given that clearly, A, it's not working, and B, it's now causing us actual harm, and C, so many people who voted for it have now changed their minds. OK, so I want to make a couple of points. First of all, Gillian made an extremely uh, valid point in her first answer, saying she had hoped that Brexit would make us a more uh, forward-looking and nimble economy, and that's exactly what I, I, I would have hoped for. It's made us a like smaller economy. Say, you let Gillian talk, I wouldn't mind completing my answer, if possible. No, I was clarifying um, it's rather nimble. I would well, use the word I, smaller. It's, actually it's joined, shrunk we, our economy. We, we've, we've joined the Trans-Pacific um, community of trade, which doesn't come the parliament and all these other laws and, and infrastructures which the British people have rejected. But we've missed out on a big opportunity to do things like take VAT off energy bills, to slash our corporation tax, we don't have AstraZeneca moving to Ireland, to state subsidise vital sectors, so Tesla wants to build their car manufacturing here and we could prop up British Vault through uh, state subsidy. We've actually, all of the things that might have been quite ambitious and a sort of post-Brexit industrial strategy are not being done. Now, look, I'm all about democracy, and if there was a clamour to reopen that can of worms, who am I to say no? I'll probably end up back in Brussels. But there's more, I would life. say there's more political but, cowardice. But I think there's, Keir Starmer ought to do it and ought to be calling for it, but he doesn't things, want to risk potentially losing well, the election. There are other things that are not being discussed openly right now that I think we really ought to be discussing, and one of those big things is PESCO, which is the common EU defence policy. Now, part of this is they want to now set up a common arms procurement across the bloc, which the UK is going to be dragged in. Into. This means we can't buy our own weapons for our own armed forces, which essentially means we can't determine if we go to war, how we go to war, you know, who we'd go to war against. And I think that that sort of impingement... Why are we part of NATO? Freedom, well, NATO is very important, and I'll tell you... Why are we, a part, of of people, a, why are we part of an organisation like NATO, given that but you, you clearly believe we're so much better on our own, well, no, no, so much no, no, stronger no, militarily? No, we're no, not, though, are we? I didn't say we, that. We're actually a member of no, NATO. No, NATO is absolutely vital. And if you speak to people from the intelligence sectors and from the armed forces, in fact, very senior people here, um, they think that the EU's plans to set up PESCO are disastrous and a direct threat to NATO. Right, but let me ask, you, let me ask you, what would it take for you to change your mind? Uh, what it would take for me to change my mind is the EU being a trading bloc, not this thing that imposes its own social legislation, that imposes foreign affairs legislation. So you could be now, persuaded, you could be persuaded, persuaded to go people. back into the well, EU. Well, it, but not on the terms of freedom. No, but you could. No, not on the terms of freedom. Hypothetically, you could. a trading bloc only. Okay, well, we're, getting, we're getting somewhere. Nothing wrong with Nigel trade. Farage admits it's a failure. You admit you could see us going back in. I think we're no, moving not, in the right I direction. I could see us going back in. Uh, Gillian, I think we're making progress live on air here. I w Can I say one thing, which is that one of the reasons I think it is actually worth thinking about having another vote was that um, the biggest tragedy, perhaps, of the last vote, the referendum, was that many young people in Britain didn't bother to vote. It's their fault. Mm. It's tragic. Um, I would very much hope if there was another referendum that they would vote, because, frankly, Brexit matters far more to their future than someone as old and crumbly like me. Um, and all the polls suggest that it's the younger generation in particular who are most upset by the loss of being part of the EU. And so I think that's mm -hmm. actually a reason to actually have another vote at some point, a referendum, to make sure we hear the younger voice um, yeah. properly, because they matter. I, I totally agree. But just on the matter of being upset, when you describe yourself as old and crumbly, how do you think that makes me feel? <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever. You know, the point is, I don't have as much stake as my own kids or anyone else. Uh, I so, think you make you know, a very, think, a very frankly, valid point. My I would son, actually, I, I would... agree. So, my sons are all in their twenties. I think that most young people I've spoken to would go back into the EU in a heartbeat. But I do think I believe in democracy. I just don't understand why you can't even get summer jobs. Yeah, yeah, I just, I just they can't get, get summer jobs in, in Europe anymore. You know, I, it's, it's, I, I, it's I, insane. There are so many. There, there are so many things that are wrong about the lack of benefits of... It's not just a lack of benefit from Brexit, it's active harm from Brexit. And there's got to be a point at which the country goes, enough of the self-harm, let's go back to the country, and if this time a majority vote to go back in the EU, well, OK, it's been embarrassing, we tried, we failed, as Nigel Farage says, we move on. Good